In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Um, so I'm having trouble kind of pulling this all together in my head, but um, the, the topic I want to I talk to you about is this concept of how and where we experience God. You cold, Kiro? Check like cold. I have a sweatshirt in my car. You want it? It's fine. Thank you. I, seriously, I have a sweatshirt. It's, it's very warm and very nice. Take Jason's hat. Um, beanie. And it matches his shirt. Yeah, me didn't. So, um, I, I, I want us to kind of think about how and where we experience God. And the, 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 the focus and the, the, the topic, I guess, of the talk is God in the, in the present moment. Right? And the, 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 the key relationship of how how God manifests himself to us. And it isn't always very clear. So there's a story about St. Mary's coffin. Does anyone know this story? After she passed away, her, they were carrying her coffin. It's in the Sinexar. What's the story? Does anyone know the story? Hi? Yeah. Yeah. You know the story. Good. Not exactly. Yeah. So he remembers the key part, right? So what happened is they were, her, they were carrying her coffin in a procession. And uh, a, a, a Jewish priest who was very upset. The arms fall off or something. Yeah, exactly. So, and so a Jewish priest comes over. And of course, they're carrying their coffin on shoulders. That's how they did it back. And there's a very solemn event. And the body is a very sacred thing. This Jewish priest comes and he, he, he tries to push the coffin over and knock it down on the floor. Right? Knock it off the shoulders of the apostles. Now you can imagine what that would be. Like how insulting that would be to her. You know, to, the coffin falls. It probably breaks. Her body falls out on the ground. Right? Just lots of badness. Right? And... Um, and then you all, some of you know the story, right? So what happens is as he puts his hands on the coffin to knock it over, right? An angel comes and cuts his hands off. And then they're attached to the coffin, right? And of course, this isn't pleasant. So he starts screaming. And um, he ends up, you know, uh, the apostles end up healing his, his arms, and then you ask yourself, well, like, why would that happen? And when I was told this story when I was little, okay, how do you think I was told it? I was told by somebody, you know, strong, who said, what did he say? You see? See what happens? Try to knock over the coffin of St. Mary? Get your arms cut off. Shaif? Shaif Rabbina? That's what happens to you if you go... I never tried it again. And I never, and I never tried to knock anyone's coffin over after that. He's like, this is what happens if you go to a dance or hold a girl's hand. You get your hand cut off, right? <laughs> so, um, was, you know, we went through a lot at my age. So anyway, so um, it was a story of vengeance. It was a story of God's wrath. It was a story of this is what happens when you mess with us, right? Um, and I always wondered as I got older, is that kind of mean? It's a little harsh. You can cut a guy's arms off. Eh. Them. Huh? They healed them after. So. Yeah, but it's still not nice. You know? It's not the nicest way. And what kind of message is that? And so, the, you have to look, let's look back at the Jewish priest that did this. Why would this Jewish priest do this? There were other Jewish priests there who were watching this procession of the mother of the guy who caused them so much trouble and they didn't do anything. Why not? Why did he do something? Yeah. He was better than the other ones. He stuck to his faith more than the other ones. The other ones saw in their minds a demonic body going by who brought Satan into the world and they thought, ugh, 
But he saw it, he said, I will not let this stand. This is my faith. And I am, I am more courageous than every other Jewish priest watching this. And if they don't have the guts to do it, I will. Right? So he's better than the other Jewish priests. He was more zealous. He cared more about his faith than anyone else. He loved God more than they did. Right? And he wanted them to worship the Lord in the right way. Does it remind you of someone? Another Jewish zealous guy? Another Pharisee, son of a Pharisee? Paul. Right? As in St. Paul, yeah, I saw he just came. He texted you, just, you know, wait for him to come to the meeting. Yeah, and he, really? Or her, whoever it is. So, I didn't mean to call you up here. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they'll be able to find us. We're right here. See, there it is. And, and if they can't spot us, they need help. You know what I'm saying? Your children. <laughs> now, I know my children know where we are, but the, it's the, you know, the people Peter is interested in the most. It's, I love embarrassing people. It's not a good trait. Um, so who does that remind you of? St. Paul. St. Paul, right? So we did this. All right, so... And St. Paul was also chosen for this exact same characteristic, right? He was more aggressive and more loving than all the others. And so God picked him and said, because you're so loving, I'm going to turn you into something better than what you were before. Hey, guys. <laughs> Traffic. <laughs> all right, so... Welcome. All right, let me wait for the... All right, so then you have to ask yourself, he loved God so much that he was willing to go take a chance and knock over someone's coffin during a funeral. And so what did God do? God loved him back. How did he love him back? He cut his arms off. Now, does that seem like a very loving thing? Not on the surface. Neither does, blinding Neither does blinding someone. Neither does a lot of things, right? But he, he couldn't allow him to be in that state. So he cut his arms off. He sent him an amazingly difficult situation. Someone could say a very cruel test, a punishment, vengeance, whatever you want to call it, right? Until he screamed and said, please help me to the apostles. And so because he loved him and he wanted to bring him back, he cut his arms off. And sometimes that's what it takes. Are you here? <laughs> he did. Um, um, so he cut his... <laughs> so he cut his arms off, right? And did it work? Does anyone know how this Jewish priest ends his life? As a martyr, as a Christian, for the name of God, for the name of Christ. So this Jewish priest went and became similar to St. Paul, a martyr for Christ. Died preaching Jesus. And so what this tells us is sometimes the story starts one way. And you think to yourself, here's an interpretation of the story, but it's not the right interpretation. And like I told you earlier, I was told the wrong interpretation. I was told the interpretation of someone's own perspective, their own vengeance, their own, I want God to cut this guy's arms off. And then they end with, you know, yeah, he became a Christian, but you see what God did, right? And that's the most important part of the story. So, Sometimes when God gives us these situations, we have to think to ourselves and we have to allow ourselves to think maybe getting my arms cut off isn't the worst thing in the world. Maybe this is something from God, very hard, but it's important. So let's look at the, the water into wine story. Smaller problem, not enough wine at the wedding. Very embarrassing at that time to not have wine. What did St. Mary do? 
First thing she did, first thing she didn't do is what? She didn't try to solve the problem. She didn't try to fix it. She didn't even tell Christ what to do, did she? Nope. And she says, mom, moms tell people what to do all the time. That's what moms do, right? But she didn't. What did she say? They have no wine. So what did she do? She presented the problem to God. And what did she do? She allowed God to fix it the way he wanted to fix it. She had no idea what he was going to do. In fact, she even told the servants what? Do whatever he says, right? I have no idea what he's going to do. But yet she took control out of her hands. This is hard to do, by the way, because we like to control situations, right? You ever watch uh, a mom or a dad with their kids? They control the situation, right? That's what parents do. We make sure it happens the way we want it to happen, right? The birthday cake isn't getting allocated. Oh, no, here, cut the cake, put it like this. Now do this, do that. And, and that's just one example, right, of control. But yet she allowed herself to not be in control. And she allowed God to solve it. And so what do we do when we have no solution to a problem? We put it up in prayer and we say, do whatever he says. How do we say that in today's vernacular? What do we say like 30 times every liturgy? Thy will be done. But yet she actually did it. And when you look at the story of the five loaves and the two fish, a similar story, they have no food. What did the disciples do? Very different. Huh? No. Yes. And what else? They have no more than money in the north. Yeah. Even we saw ourselves in the slavery. No. <laughs> Even if we don't, we saw ourselves in the slavery, we won't have enough money. Oh, yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. Send the people home. Huh? Yeah, they told us send the people home. Send the people home or we have to buy food. What did they do to Jesus? They boxed him in. They said, here's your options, bro. Here's what you have to do. I'm going to tell you, you're God. I've seen you do miracles, but whatever. I'm an apostle. I'm Peter. I know things. Here's what you got to do. Here's your choices. I figured them out. My head has run through the done the analysis. This is how much money would cost. We don't have the money. So your other option is send the people home. The response, send your best. The response with, between them and what Mary, St. Mary did is polar opposites. Their response is more like my response. I tell God, here are the options. In my prayer, I usually, in fact, and tell him, I don't even give him two because he doesn't need that. He just needs the one that I've already thought of. Right. right? And I tell him, oh, this is what needs to happen. Uncle Safwat needs to be healed of cancer. Right? This needs to happen to my boss. My mom has to realize that I'm an adult. My whatever has to figure out blah, blah, blah. And I just give him the, 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 the thing. I tell him, this is what has to happen. Right? And so what St. Mary allowed to happen was she opened herself up to let God in that moment do whatever it is he needs to do. And she didn't base it on history. She didn't say, remember when you... When you were four or 10 or 11 and you did that miracle or this miracle, right? She didn't tell him based on history. She told him in the moment, do whatever it is you need to do right now. Yes. So what, can't you look at it in terms of they didn't want to like bother him and they kind of wanted to respect his, his presence. So they, they're trying to like make everything go smooth. So they're trying to think for him. It's tough for him to think. So they said, listen, what we're going to do is we're going to think for you because we're humans. We, you know, we own the world. No, but it, I think of it as, as like, let's say, let's say, for example, like there's a conference and there's like a big guest speaker, right? 
and a problem happens, so you try to fix it, so the guest speaker can you know, can go on with like whatever the. the I that I, I see your analogy. Here's more of the analogy. The guest speaker, someone asks the guest speaker a, a question. So they walk up, they say, okay, here you have one of two answers to answer this question. Now I know you just flew in from, you know, England or wherever, right? But here's the two answers you get, and that one isn't gonna work, so really you only have one answer. Here's what you have to say. And be like, oh my gosh, it's been so long. I know, how are you? Good. Welcome, you done with finals? I am, I finished school two weeks ago. Oh my gosh, <laughs> killing it. All right. So, so let's think about this concept of, of being in the present moment, right? So again, they gave him options. And what did God choose? What did Christ choose? The third option, right? And we see this a lot, right? In the story of the born blind, the disciples also gave him options. What was his options? Oh. Uh, they asked him, they say, so who sinned? This man or his parents? We know the answers, right? We're just, we're just going to let you pick the final one. But I know it's got to be one of these. And what did he say? Option three. Right? And we see this a lot in the stories of the Bible, right? You know, like the crossing the Red Sea, right? What did, what did the people of, of Israel say when they saw the army of Egypt coming? Either they're going to kill us or... They're going to take us back to Egypt and make us slaves. Perfectly logical, you know, answers, right? And what did, what did God choose? Option number three, right? Which is, no, we're going to go through the sea. Right? So when we allow God in the moment to solve the problem, he often solves it in a way that we would not expect, that we don't think is possible. And often when we look back at that solution, we're like, wow, you know, and, and, and I have times in my life that I've looked back and said, you know, if I was God, I couldn't have come up. Like if you said, okay, Mark, you're God, do anything. I wouldn't have thought of that one. And it's my own life. And it was perfect. And it was perfectly timed and perfectly crafted. So if you look at the miracles of Jesus, oftentimes they end with, with a sense, and they believed in him. Right? And this was just the first one of that, of those miracles. And they believed in him. So the miracle helps me start to believe. Then what happens? Life happens. Right? And then two weeks later, I get another problem. Like, oh man, now it's all over. Now there's no way this is ever going to get fixed. This is a hot mess. This is a whatever. Right? And then God comes along and he solves it again. You're like, okay, that, you know, I'll never doubt again. I'll never doubt again. Really, really never doubt again. And then two weeks later, you doubt again, right? So what we have to train ourselves to do is to live in the, in the moment because God is always in the moment. God is not in the past and God is not in the future. And every time I find myself thinking in, in the past or the future, you have to realize that that's actually from Satan. Because when you think about the past, what do you think about? Usually. Regret. Usually think I shoulda, coulda, woulda. I wish this had happened. If only that person had said this. If only she hadn't done that. If only I had gotten to this school. If only I had studied harder. If only this, right? All we do when we think about the past is regret, right? And even when you think about the, the, the thing we say in the liturgy, the remembrance of evil bearing death. The remembrance of evil. How many people here have remembered someone's evil towards you? All of us, right? How many people here have had someone do something just really nasty? And every time we remember that evil, where are we? In the past. And what are we? Pissed off, right? Because in the past, that's where the remembrance of evil that what? Entails death. If you live there, you will always be angry. You'll always be upset. Okay? And you'll always think of all the people who wronged you. And if there are some people 
You know, I remember when I, when I went to USC, I joined USC 10 years ago. Uh, this one professor, she was telling me about this other professor and how horrible of a human being he was and how that he was basically the devil. And she was telling me about fights they had had. And as she's telling me, the veins in her neck are bulging. The vein in her forehead's bulging. She's visibly shaken, right? And she's telling me about this fight. And then he did this and he said this, can you believe that, blah, 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 blah. And she's, heart rate's up, everything. I'm like, oh my God, I, I can't believe he did that. When did this happen? 15 years ago. And she's telling me about it like it was seven seconds ago. And she's, her heart rate, she's, she's having a physiological response to this fight and she remembers it vividly. And she will not let it go. And she will live in it forever. And she will go to her grave hating and being resentful and angry and bitter with that man. And there's people like this all the time, right? Just go ask your parents. Hey, how come we don't ever visit Uncle Susu or Tante Susu anymore, Uncle Fifi, right? And they'll tell you, Asle Tante Susu di, you know what she did to me? 1975? <laughs> we went to the wedding and she wore the same dress. And she knows I have the dress. Khalas. I don't talk to her, right? And... Ask your parents. Ask them about the long lost uncle that you just never get to talk, get to see. What happened? Let me tell you what he did 20 years ago. We all have one of those, right? What are your parents doing? Forgive me. Remembrance of evil entailing death. And they hold on to it and it's almost like they love it. You know, I talked to one guy once and I said, you know, why don't you serve? You know what he said to me? The Archangel Michael guys. He goes, let me tell you what an Abuna did to me, Abuna Philemon, 20 years ago, right? And he tells me this very well-rehearsed story that he's told dozens of times. He's very proud as he's telling me, and he's all about it, you know, and this, and this is why I don't, you know, and he's just, and it's like, what's wrong with you, right? What's wrong with you? First of all, I'm listening to the story. I'm like, Abuna didn't do anything wrong. You're obviously an idiot, right? <laughs> this is, I'm like, let me tell you why he thought you're an idiot because I can hear it now, right? But that's not the point even, right? The point is he's living in that past moment and just replaying it, right? And just massaging it and just, just getting all up in it, okay? And then the other opposite extreme is also there, right? The future. And there are people who just think about the future all the time. And what's the future full of? Anxiety. Why is the future full of anxiety? Hopefully it's full of hope. You can't guarantee it. You can't change it. You can't predict it. So what do you do? So what happens when you find out a coworker has got some dirt on you? Panic, right? So what do you start doing? You're like, like they, they saw me sleeping on the job, right? And this coworker doesn't like me because I busted them two weeks ago. What would you do? Try to get dirt on I was going to say that. Huh? Try to get dirt on that. That's dirt. right. Good. Go to your supervisor first. Go to your supervisor first. Good. Eat them for lunch before they... Kill them. <laughs> Good. These are all good. And cut off their arms. Good. <laughs> Vengeance is mine, saith these guys, right? So, um, and when are you going to come up with these scenarios? Five seconds. Huh? Five seconds. Okay. Keep going. When are you going to think up of all the things you need to do? Huh? No one's really done this, I can see. When? Not in the moment. At night. When you're trying to be sleeping. No, not when you're trying to pray. It's when you're trying to sleep. And then you sit there and you think of all the scenarios. You know, he could tell blah, blah, blah. So what I'll do is I, I'll talk to that person and I'll say this, this, this. And then I'll preempt. But what if he goes to this? And oh, what if he brings it up like that? Okay, he would do that. So what I'll do is I'll, you know, I'll feign my heart attack and then throw myself on the ground. And that way that'll show that, right? And while you're supposed to be sleeping... You sit there and live through every possible scenario, right? 
and she could be saying this about me, so I'm gonna talk to her. Well, how did she find out? Well, she found out, she must've found out from that person, so I'm gonna do this, but what if she told that this, then I'll do, right? Now, what's the problem here? You can't control any of these things. You can't control this person. I mean, how many times have you found out someone has, has said something about you? And then you try to figure out who do they talk to? And what do they say? And maybe I should get to that person and tell them the truth. But what if that person already told that person? Then what do I say? What's the best answer here? Don't do any of it. Live in the moment. Because the future is all about anxiety. All right? And, and every time you find yourself running through scenarios in the future that you can't control, you should know that that's from the devil. You know, when, when I, sometimes I'll talk to a couple and they, you know what, you know, he could do, he could do this, this, and this. So I'm going to do this, this, and this to him. I'm like, you know, he didn't do anything yet, <laughs> but he might. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this. I'm like, well, now you just drew first blood, right? You just attacked an unarmed man because he might do something in three months. Yeah, but I did it first. So the reason, the reason God is in the present moment and we see these moments like this, right? You look at someone like the right-hand thief, okay? So imagine if you're God and some piece of garbage thief, right, who's stolen and killed and done all kinds of countless things says, you know what, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What would you do? Yeah, right. I'd say, yeah, right. First of all, you're on a cross, right? So your whole confession is very suspect, right? At this point, I would pretty much say anything to anybody, okay? And I'm sure lots of people on crosses were crying out, confess. Anybody can confess on a cross. You're about to die, right? Where were you before, you know? It's kind of like when, when you, 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 you know, a child steals something, you catch them, and then after they steal, okay, yeah, yeah, I did it. Like, well, I just caught you. <laughs> of course, you're going to confess it now. It's not worth much now, right? You find out someone's talking about you. You say, hey, yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah, I, you know, I, I was going to tell you about that. It's like, you're lying, right? So, but Christ in that moment is what? Like what? It's like a child. Because children don't remember the past, right? You ever see, watch kids fight? Right? One guy's got a train, the other kid takes the train, the other kid hits him on the head, one starts crying, hits him back with the train, right? The mommies jump in, like Habibi, no, 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 share, blah, 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 right? And then like seven seconds later, what are they both doing? They're playing again. It's like, and then the moms, God bless them, go, isn't that the boy that hit you? Remember last week that boy hit you? You stay away from that boy. He's a bad boy. What's she, what's she doing, unfortunately? She's teaching him to hate. She's teaching him to hold a grudge. She's teaching him to become an adult. She's teaching him to not be like God. Because God doesn't remember. So this thief has been doing some, all this crap for 30 years. He gets caught. He's about to die. And he says, hey, you know, you look like a nice guy. Remember me when you come in your kingdom. And what does Christ say? It's all forgotten. Like a child. He doesn't remember any of it. And I encourage you that when you have someone come back to you after all the stuff they've done and they say, I'm sorry, you say, I already forgave you. Like it never happened. Forgive, uh, you know, sorry for what? I don't even remember. Be like a child. Because that's how God is. All right, so let me read you this quote from this book. In the present moment, because of his infinitely merciful love, we always have the possibility of starting again, not impeded by the past or tormented by the future. And that's what we see with the right-hand thief, not impeded by the past or tormented by the future. He continues, this is, this is where God is present. Every moment, whatever it brings is filled with God's presence, rich with the possibility of communion, communion with God. We do not commune with God in the past or the future but by welcoming each instant as the place where he gives himself to us. We should learn to live in each moment as sufficient to itself, for God is there. And if God is there, we lack nothing. 
We feel we are missing this or that simply because we're living in the past or in the future instead of dwelling in every second. So, this is what we experience, right, in the Gospels, right? Even the story of the prodigal son. The dad comes back, or sorry, the son comes back, and what does the dad do? It's all forgotten, right? And the dad throws his arms around him and says, never mind. It's as if none of it happened. My son was dead and now he's alive. He doesn't hold a grudge. He doesn't punish him, right? And even if you notice, the prodigal son is doing the logical thing. He's doing the apostle thing, right? You can imagine the walk back, right? He's, he's running through the scenario. What's my dad going to say? What would your dad say? <laughs> First, you take off his belt. <laughs> he's just like, First, I'm going to hit you with a belt. <laughs> a few times, right? But so he already played it out. What, did, what, what, what conclusion did he come to about his dad? His dad was going to say what? Huh? You're not my son. He ran it through. You guys are just going to turn around and just talk? Is that what's going to happen? Really? Oh, okay. All right, that's fine. Um, so he had already run it through. Miss you, Dahlia. Um, and he concluded that his dad would say, you are not my son. And so just like the apostles were doing, he preempted them and said, look, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say you're not my son. So I already have the, the, the solution. What was the solution? Hired me as your, take me as one of your hired servants. I, I know what you're going to say. Here's, what, here's what's going to happen. And again, what does God do? Option three. Throws his arms around him. We're going to have a party. A what? Kill the fatted calf, get the robe, get the ring, get the sandals, all the things. And so uh, St. Paul says in Philippians, forget those things which are behind and reach forward to those things which are ahead. And we see this in the hymns of the church, right? If you notice during the resurrection, what do we say? Christ is what? Is risen. Right? We don't even like to talk about his resurrection in the past tense. And in fact, all the feasts, and we're not very good with the translations yet, all the feasts should always be in the present moment. Christ is born. Christ is resurrected. Christ is crucified. Christ is baptized. Christ is circumcised. Christ is all of these things. Right? Because we don't live as if these things happened in history. Right? We live them in the present moment. Right? This is what we see in the Eucharist. Right? We don't say that the Eucharist reminds us of what happened 2,000 years ago. We say the Eucharist is the Last Supper. Right? And when you say, who conducted the liturgy today? You don't ever say Abuna. Christ did. Right? Abuna is just standing there as a placeholder. You know, because you've got to see somebody. Someone's got to say the words. But it's Christ who, who conducted the liturgy that day. Right? And in fact, in the Gregorian liturgy, there's this part that just blows my mind every time we say it. It's at the end. Can anyone think of what I'm thinking of? of yeah. Oh, you who blessed in the past, now bless. Oh, you who broke, now break. Right? So he's saying, I'm breaking, but it's you who's breaking. I mean, I don't know how a priest gets through that part without crying. Like, these, they're not my hands. They're your hands. You're the, ones who, you're the one who blessed. You're the one who broke, right? You're the one who gave thanks. And you're still the one who's doing it, right? So the Eucharist isn't a past event that we remember and say, oh, yeah, I remember that was really cool. It's that moment. We live in the Last Supper every single time. That's why in the icon of the Last Supper, right? If you ever look at the icon of the, an icon of the Last Supper, right? The table never ends in the icon. You're always sitting at the table. Right? The table ends at you. Look at any icon of the Last Supper. It has to be an Orthodox icon, right? Not like, you know, Michelangelo's or whatever, right? But, and it's always you're at the table, right? Because the Last Supper isn't an event that we remember. It's an event that we live. And this is the kind of thing like when, 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 Jesus, when Peter denied Jesus three times, Right? And he's very shamed. And if you notice, the first person Jesus went to talk to after the resurrection was whom? Peter. Why? Why did he pick Peter? 
Peter was the apostle, the only one still alive, that had done the worst thing. So he went to him first. Why? Why would you go to them first? Because he knew he was hurting the most. Right? He knew that Peter was the most crushed by what happened. Because everyone else ran away, but Peter denied. And so Peter felt like crap. So he went to him first. And what did he ask him? Three times? Do you love me? Right? And that's it. If so, feed my sheep. You know, you're, you're an apostle again. The past is done. In Arabic, we say, il fait met. Whatever's in the past is dead. Okay. <clears throat> so, another quote from the book. I often say jokingly that the ladder of perfection has only one step. The step we take today. Without concerning ourselves about the past or the future, we can decide to believe today. Place all our trust in God today. Love God and neighbor today. Whether our good res resolutions produce success or failure, next day we can begin again. Not relying on our strength, but only on God's faithfulness. This attitude is fundamental in the spiritual life. St. Paul describes it, Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. So God isn't an accountant, right? He doesn't add up all the bad things we did and add up all the good things we did. God takes us in the moment, even the moment of death. And that's why someone like the right-hand thief can do all the stuff, stuff he's done all his life, or St. Mary of Egypt, or St. Moses the Black, or St. Augustine, or all these saints who just did horrible things their whole lives, and nobody cares. And unfortunately, people do. Right? Someone will show up to church and they go, you know what he did? And what should the answer really be? Who cares? He's here. She's here. Throw your arms around them and kill the fatted calf. Right? Don't give me, you know what they did? That's not the way God thinks. Unfortunately, that's sometimes the way some of us think. God isn't about history. You know, how many times you hear people say, you know, I started this church. I was one of the first people that started this church. Who cares? Do you want a medal? You want like a certificate? Right? Or years of service. I've served God 20 years. I've been the Sunday school teacher for 50. Who cares? Put on your resume or something. Right? Because what happens when you make a statement like, I've served for 20 years? What does that mean? God owes me. Right? And that's what gets us into trouble. Right? I've served with this Abuna for 30 years and he turns his back on me. Why are you saying 30 years? Someone owe you? Is that like you, you know, you want some, some you know, certificate of achievement? Does God owe you? Does, does the person who served 20 years get more, I don't know, points than the guy who served 10 years? What about the guy who served for a moment? Right? And where do we see this, this play out very, very clearly? Which parable? That's right. The parable of the 11th hour. Right? You guys get that guys hired in the first hour, which is what time? 6 a.m., right? They started working at 6 a.m. Then the guys got hired at the third hour, 9 a.m. The, the guys hired the sixth hour, 12. The guys hired in the, where am I at? The ninth hour, right? 3 p.m. The guys hired, and then the guys hired at 11th hour, 5 p.m. Worked for one hour. Got the same wage. What's God saying? I don't care how long you've been working. Right? It's about that last moment in life. And how many saints think about that last moment? So there's a story about St. Macarius. St. Macarius is like a legend, right? He's one of my favorites. And he was dying. He's on his deathbed. And, and the tradition of the monks is they all gather around him and say psalms until he dies. So he's dying. And then they start smelling something. And they start hearing angels. They're coming to take him. So what do the, the monks say? Pro, you made it. 
like angels are freaking angels are coming to take you. Right? You've done good. And what did St. Macarius say? Not yet. I'm not there yet. Like, don't do this to me. Right? It's all about the moment. Right? And it doesn't matter how much you've done or what history you have. Or it's about, are I moving up or down at that moment? Right? And we see that in the story of the right-hand thief. It's not about the level you've reached or, or the number of things you know or the number of hymns you've learned or the number of verses you've memorized or the number of lessons you've given. Right? And how many people have, have served the church faithfully for 20 years and by the end are demons and turn on the church. You know, the story of, of Saul, King Saul and David. King Saul started awesome. He was a great king. He was a very faithful person. And then he lost his way along the way. God protect us all, right? It's easy to start strong, right? It's about laying in that last moment. Another quote. He says, sometimes we feel we've wasted much time and missed all too many opportunities to love and grow. How many people feel that way? Like there's an opportunity to serve or an opportunity to do this. If the feeling leads to real repentance and to starting again courageously and trustingly, starting again, then it is something positive. But if the sense of time wasted gets us down and makes us feel we've ruined our lives, we must reject it. Anytime you think, I messed up, I've ruined everything, reject that thought. That thought is not from God. That thought is from the devil. Every time you, you're told something negative, like you messed it all up, just go kill yourself. That thought is from the devil. But if the sense of time wasted gets us down and makes us feel like we've ruined our lives, we must reject it. To lock ourselves in the past would only add another sin to those already committed. Right? And again, the story of the parable of the 11th hour comes to mind, right? It's not about the past. And that's what the workers wanted, right? Those first hour guys, they're like, well, I'm sure he's going to give me more money. I worked longer. That's human reasoning, right? That's not the reasoning of God. All right. And so this is a basic tenant of monastic spirituality. St. Anthony of Egypt, as you all know, when he was 100 years old, he used to say, I haven't yet begun to be converted. He used to say, every day I say to myself, today I begin my spiritual life. So the reason I'm telling you like, about this isn't, it's to keep us focused on the, the, the possibility and not let us think about what could have been, right? Or what I messed up. Because if you start going to what I've messed up and all the mistakes I've made and all the things I've ruined, you're going to go down a dark hole and you're going to live a, a, a horrible life. And if you start remembering all the evils everyone's done for you, you're going to be a victim and you're going to have a victim mindset and all the people who did bad things to me. And if only they hadn't done this, you know, she screwed me over, he screwed me over. And that's why I never X. And we can live in that way. That's not where God is. He would repeat the words of St. Paul, this is St. Anthony, unceasingly. The Lord liveth before whom I stand today. St. Anthony pointed out that when Elijah said today, he took no account of the past. And so as though he were still at the very beginning, every day he strove to live as he wished to appear before God, pure of heart and ready to obey God's will like no other. And no other, sorry. And so this is like any relationship you have with a friend, right? How many people have had friends for five years and then not have a friendship? How many couples are divorced and say, we used to have a great relationship? Okay, but well, you're divorced now. Yeah, but it used to be great. Does that count? No. Right? And so our relationship with God is like that. It's about now. Focus on the now. All right, I'll, fit, I'll end with this quote. God is everywhere and there is no place God is not. You cry out to him, where are you, my God? And he answers, I am present, my child. 
I'm always beside you. I'm inside and outside, above and below. Wherever you turn, everything shouts God. In him we live and move. We breathe God, we eat God, we clothe ourselves with God. Everything praises and blessings and blesses God. All of creation shouts his praise. Everything animate and inanimate speaks wondrously and glorifies the creator. Let every breath praise the Lord. So even he's talking here even about nature, inanimate and animate objects. And I like this, the way he says this, he says, we breathe God, we eat God, we clothe ourselves with God. Everything is God. And so going back to this like, concept of I don't have time for spiritual life and I don't have time. Spiritual life isn't about like endless hours at church. Spiritual life isn't about endless hours doing things. Spiritual life is about a constant rhythm in our lives. Every part of our life, it's a rhythm. Working, studying, working out, whatever you're doing, talking to a friend, everything is God, right? In every piece. That's the present moment. Not like when I get home, I'll pray. Or I prayed this morning. Right? The prayer is now. It's always now. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Yes, sir. Do you have any uh, tips or practices you like for yourself when you start remembering the past or thinking of the future? You just have to be very aware of it. Right? As soon as I start thinking of what someone's done to me and... You, I mean, it's not easy. I, you know, I'm not telling you I do it very well. Like, as soon as I start remembering stuff people have done, I just have to stop. I, sometimes I just shake my head. I physically shake my head, like, and I'll, I, sometimes I'll actually out loud say no and just move on because I, I have to stop it. Because then your mind just, and I, you know, I've done all this. I've been up all night thinking about what this happened and then maybe they did this. And if I do that and then, you know, running through all the scenarios and I don't sleep for a few days and then nothing actually happens with what I thought was going to happen anyway. And I've run through all these scenarios for nothing. I'm a professor. I can see everything. Any other questions? Yeah. What's that? What's the name of the book? Uh, it's called Interior Freedom by Father Jacques Philippe. Great book. Catholic? Yep. Some Catholics are going to go to heaven. French. <laughs> 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 yeah, he's French. Jacques. J A C Q U E S. It's not Jack. That's in the south. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Glory be to God for every minute. I have our bond.